We're going to have another panel now, not quite as long, you'll be glad to hear, um, but hopefully, hopefully uh, equally fun. Uh, kind of different. So we're here to talk about um, device APIs uh, and, and network APIs. And we have uh, some experts in that area, and I'll get them to introduce themselves. I, for my part, will be, I'll be playing the part of a complete newbie who knows nothing about these things. Uh, and I'll be playing that part very well, because I am a complete newbie who knows nothing about these things. Um, so if, if you're a complete newbie who knows nothing about these things, that's fine. I, I know exactly how you feel. Um, but first of all, let's, uh, let's see who we got here. Why don't you uh, just introduce yourselves? Hi, uh, my name is Brian. I work on the PhoneGap team, uh, and device APIs are something that we've been thinking about for the past four years. All right. Go ahead. Uh, my name is Dan Applequist. I wear a number of hats. I'm the head of product management for uh, Bluevia, which is Telefonica's network API developer platform. But in past lives, I've been involved with a number of activities more around the client side of things and client APIs and web standards and that sort of thing. Hi, everyone. Um, so my name is uh, Dominique Azan Mathieu, although most people call me Don. That's much easier to say. Um, I work for WCC. I, I supervise the work on mobile in WCC in general, and uh, I've been involved in the various groups that have been developing device APIs over the past uh, three or four years now. Okay, so um, kind of the first thing I wanted to ask, and this is more directed at you guys and less at you, Brian, is uh, what are you doing here? Because you don't make browsers, and if we're talking about getting this stuff implemented, surely that's what counts. Uh, and if we want to talk about APIs, then uh, it's really the browsers we need to go to and say, hey, when are we going to get these browsers? So just sitting around writing specs doesn't seem to accomplish as much as actually shipping something. And Brian, you have shipped something, right, with PhoneGap. It could be argued, for some definition of user agent, that PhoneGap is, is user agent, where you guys are just uh, what, writing documents? Reading and writing and, you know, going to conferences and uh, spending my time traveling. No, more, more seriously, uh, indeed, an API is only as useful as it is implemented, and uh, we actually don't write uh, specs in isolation. We write specs with uh, browser vendors that are involved in uh, our working groups. And uh, while we do that, we learn quite a bit about what makes a good device API, is what makes a bad device API, and what device APIs can actually work on the web. So that's okay. uh, also in these guys' defense, they also play babysitter for all the browsers, right? So they get to they get to act as like the intermediary between these different groups. Of so they're, they're like the United Nations uh, when it comes to the browsers. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so I uh, proactively leverage synergies uh, right. between <laughs> no. nice. Well, I'm glad we've got all our ducks in a row. We can, uh... <laughs> no, um, in, in fact, in, Blue, in the case of Bluevia, um, we're very much about writing code. But we're not about writing code on the client side. We're about writing code on the server side. So we've got a working API platform where developers can come in, register, get an API key, start working with our APIs, start doing stuff, start building stuff, and that's very much the focus and the ethos of, of Bluevia. It's all about code and writing code and working with developers, so. Uh, you okay, know, so that, you, do, you do actually make stuff. Yeah. Uh, I'm being too harsh. But I mean, for instance, with, with something like PhoneGap, is everyone here familiar with PhoneGap, I guess? Yeah, okay, good. Something like PhoneGap, did you look at what kind of uh, standardization was out there? Or was it more, no, I need to get this done, head down, do it? Yeah, it wasn't like we set out to like start working in a standardized process. Uh, we just wanted to see what the phones could do that they couldn't do before. And actually, the DAP didn't exist when we started doing this stuff. There were groups. Uh, there was Bondi, most notably, um, that was looking at these ideas. But um, we thought their APIs sucked, so we didn't really follow them. Right. I guess that's always a danger, right? You make a specification, yeah. and the implementer thinks it sucks. Um, we need to clear this up, exactly how standardization and implementation work. Uh, yesterday, James was trying to make the case that, um, oh, we'd love these APIs, but standardization takes so long, and that's why we don't have them. Um, but in my experience, that's not the way it works. There's a lot of implementation, then standardization. Something like XML HTTP request would be a good example of that. Um, where, where's the truth? Is it standardization, then implementation, or is it implementation and then standardization? Well, it's either both or neither, really. I mean, in practice, you have people that want to implement stuff that come to WCC and say, this technology will only be as useful 
if it gets implemented everywhere. I mean, a web technology that only works in a single browser isn't really a web technology for me. It's, you know, mm. just another proprietary API. So in practice, how does that work? You know, sometimes the browser vendor will start by experimenting in their own proprietary API, and then they will bring it, bring into WCC. Sometimes uh, other non-implementers will say we really need that API, so we will start you know prototyping, and you can build you know JavaScript themes and so on to to do this prot prototyping. And then based on this prototyping, there will be a, a spec, and in parallel with the spec, uh, some early implementation inside browsers. So it's more like this back and forth dance between implementation Absolutely. and, and uh, The only way you can make a good standard is, is if there is this back and forth. Otherwise, you're just making up stuff. Can I, can I make a, uh, one of the standards uh, efforts that I was involved in was the geolocation API. Mm -hmm. and. Um, I think that uh, I think there's, there's been a lot of mud, mud slung at the Geo API from a privacy perspective, but I actually think it was one of the most functional uh, examples of how standards and implementation work together. I mean, you had a, a company, Google in this case, that had an API. They shopped it around. They said, where can we go to get this standardized? A lot of people said, go to W3C. W3C started a group. It was a targeted group. We had a very uh, you know, reasonably small number of people, but good representation from vendors and different people in the ecosystem. Came out with a spec. The spec was already implemented in iPhone before it came out uh, you know, uh, as, I think, into into candidate recommendation and and then uh, people were, were using it and and it, I think it, it is just a really good example of the cycle working correctly and in a fairly short time time scale as well Google gears was the first implementation that's right yeah yeah, yeah. yeah yeah all right so um I mean a sort of design principle that runs through the history of standardization from IETF to w3c it's been this idea of rough consensus and running code which very much speaks to that cycle of, you know, whatever ships first, that's, that would be preferred to some theoretically great format or, or um, API that never actually ships. And it strikes me in the case of, let's say, access to the phone camera, camera or device camera, there's an implementation, and that's phone gap. So what's there to discuss? Why not just say, we've got, a, we've got the running code, let's get the rough consensus now and say, the phone gap syntax is, is good to go, let's use it. Let me defend that though. So I don't think it was ready to go. Um, when we implemented the first camera access, we had an API called camera, but then the more it got discussed, it was like, well, this, this sensor um, is a little more complicated than what we originally thought. It's not just a camera, you could also be capturing stills and or streams of video, and then there's also audio, and it could be a front-facing camera, and it could be a back-facing camera involved, and so there's a lot more complexity to the API that we originally envisioned. So we just had this simple API, and it was like, take picture. And that, made sense and you could crop it. Um, but after they got through the standardization process a little bit, it's still in there uh, under the uh, media capture group. Okay, but web, you, yeah. you, you wanted to get something out there to get anything working, but you weren't thinking that this will form the basis of, of a standard. No, no, it was more like, can we make this thing work and then use that as the basis to build on top of, I mean, for sure. And then we've implemented the media capture API since then, so okay. there's both. Is, but there is that danger. I mean, once you ship something, you're kind of stuck. I mean, browsers certainly have browsers that problem. Browsers are stuck with it, not phone, Okay, yeah. you're okay. You, yeah. uh, <laughs> otherwise, what would you do? I don't know, um, prefix your methods and properties? <laughs> that would be crazy. Um, but I mean, so do you, you guys look at uh, existing implementations and, and very much think, well, if it's working, yeah, prior uh, art. So prior art. I yeah. mean, we always start again from prototype or early implementations or submissions from, from the group participants. In practice, if you take the PhoneGap example, uh, PhoneGap is not a web browser, which means that PhoneGap doesn't have to live with the specificities of the browser sandbox. For instance, if you go to a random web page, you don't want that random web page to start the camera or start listening to your microphone. That would be you know, a spying uh, web page. And uh, you, know, you can basically go on any random web page and you work under the assumption that nothing really bad will happen to you. Actually. Sure, okay, really. but just talking, just talking purely about the syntax of, a, of an yeah, API. But, uh, it might not be uh, obvious, but actually the syntax has a lot of uh, importance when you consider privacy and security aspects. Because, oh, okay. for instance, if you want 
to grant access to something that the user needs to approve, then suddenly you need uh, an asynchronous API, whereas you could just use a synchronous API in a context where you don't need any user mediation. Actually, that, that's a, the syntax is interesting because, well, it's not beautiful, but if you look at the geolocation example, at least it's, at least it's namespaced under geolocation, but you say, you know, um, get, get location. And in the same kind of regard it, with uh, user media or capture API, it's, it's, um, it's get user media. So it's almost implying a question. You're almost saying, hey, get this thing if you can. And then that would imply that there might be some kind of modal permission situation that happens afterwards that and then the user says, yeah, sure, you can turn on my camera this time. Okay, so it's good starting to, it's almost uh, organically they're fitting to this pattern of get thing implies it's going to be a user It's starting allowed. to look that way. Yeah, That's it seems nice. to be evolving that way. And it's not really a top-down thing. It's just the way things kind of happened. I don't know, Dom. You could speak to it better than I. Yeah, we're not very good at top-down when it comes to <laughs> designing APIs. So I, it, it's actually you know one of the difficulties also when you design new APIs. Sometimes you get you're getting prototypes that don't look at all like what has been done in other APIs, and we do want to keep uh, some level of consistency across mm. APIs, and that again means that we actually need to fiddle on the syntax and try to find what is the best way, what will be the most obvious to most web developers. Okay. Um, just to get the technical stuff out of the way, there's a whole bunch of different APIs that the W3C are working on, um, but obviously not all of them are equal priority. Um, so we could talk about all sorts, I mean, the APIs for getting access to the current volume of the device or you know, the buzzer and all that, but let's, let's get down to brass next. The ones that people care about, from what I sense from developers, uh, would be access to the address books of the contacts API, um, media capture, which is effectively the phone for streaming and pictures and, and movies, uh, and then network APIs, um, which I think would all be really useful for us to have access to on devices. Would those be the ones that are being prioritized at, in the standards bodies? So uh, media capture clearly is a very high priority, and in fact it's already shipping. Uh, it's uh, available in Chrome Canary, it's available in Opera 12 on mobile. So you can already start uh, using get user media on the web today. Uh, that being said, we are not quite done with it uh, because uh, actually dealing with video and audio streams uh, is not simple. <laughs> okay, so yeah, it's hard. Um, so yeah, there is still work, but clearly it has been such a high priority request that uh, it's clear that it will be shipping in uh, many mobile browsers in the months to come. Uh, it's in Firefox now too. Yeah, and it's also in PhoneGap, so you can try it in all those places. So Contacts is uh, an interesting story. It was actually our top priority API uh, when the device APIs working group started in 2009, and we made reasonably good progress on it. Uh, but in fact, it looks like we basically need to start over, uh, again, due to the considerations around privacy and security, and also due to the needs to integrate with uh, non-local address books, because, you know, Many of us actually keep our address book on a cloud-based service. The cloud. Yeah, the cloud. We needed the keyword. So. Yeah. Um, what I do normally, whenever anybody mentions the cloud, I, I mentally substitute the word moon, and it makes as much sense. So and it makes the conversation much more fun as well. Right. So I the, recommend you do that. Whenever anybody talks about the cloud, just mentally, mentally substitute the moon. So we did want to integrate moon-based Yeah, so uh, people keeping books. their contacts in the moon. You want to make sure that the API exactly. can, can handle that. And then, so network is your baby right now. So. Yeah, we're all about the moon and other planets yeah. that, or celestial bodies. Um, the, so I, I think it's interesting to me, uh, we're still in the middle of this culture clash, I think, between the web and mobile. Um, and there's a lot, of, the dynamic there is really evident here at this, at this conference as well. But um, my, you know, I came out of the web space and then spent a lot of time working in mobile um, as the web guy, um, kind of thinking about it from a web perspective. And what we're doing in Bluevia is we're trying to think about more like the web from a mobile in, from a mobile network perspective, right? Like, what do I want to be able to do as a web developer that um, with the mobile network, uh, being able to uh, send and receive text messages, for instance, or um, make payments, uh, allow the user to make payments directly to their mobile bill, um, 
mobile payments are something, web-based payments, you know, uh, full stop, are a problem um, for a lot of developers right now. Um, trying to fix those problems, and, and I think that that is more, it, it becomes especially relevant when you start to think about applications that work across different devices or that don't necessarily need to be resident on the phone because they're resident in, in, in the moon. In the moon. Yeah. <laughs> um, but when you talk like that about, you know, well, you know, the native apps can do all this stuff, we need to be able to do that on, on the web. Are we getting back to exactly what Scott was talking about. And I, to be honest, I got a little depressed yesterday listening to all these talks telling us how we can try and imitate native. Right? Here are these tools to try and make your apps feel more native, fe behave more native. Is that really what we're trying to do? Is that the, the limit of our imagination? Um, it seems that how can we make our app, how can we make our, our web things less webby and throw away all the usefulness of the web and try and imitate these little silos of nativeness because they've got the cool APIs. Is, is that the aim here, that we're trying to imitate native? So at least it's not my end. I think you know, we can get a lot of inspiration from native because I think native mobile apps have you know, brought a lot of new ideas, a lot of uh, inspiration that we sh would be foolish to ignore. But you know, we've just seen what you can do with the web uh, during the previous presentation. I think that's not something you would do with native apps again because you can't actually get uh, these native apps deployed in a timely fashion for the, all these the, audiences. That was a just-in-time interaction, exactly. right? Exactly. Right. Something exactly. else to consider when you think about device APIs, these, these are headless APIs. They're typically without a GUI. They're not, they're not involved in this uh, with you know, the user interaction in any actual meaningful way. There's, these are just sensors. And because of that, they're, they're inherently cross-platform. They live on all devices, most of these devices have geolocation accelerometers I mean, and cameras and all that stuff. So it's, it's an easy surface area for us to target right now. Okay, as far as what's it goes, visible. It's, it, well, we know it's stuff that native code can do and that's interesting, but it's basically the problem is it's stuff the web can't do yet. And that's the stuff that we wanna get in. Okay. And we can do it pretty easily without having to get involved in the user interface side, which in my opinion, the web has been really good at. I just, I just worry that you know, we're getting so focused on, on native mobile apps that we're going to ignore all the possibilities of other things. Jason gave a whole talk about TVs. I mean, if we're completely focused on, on mobile, are we going to, going to miss that opportunity? So and the web is clearly bigger than TVs or mobile or any other specific to, kind of device. To me, it's not, about, it's not about replicating what you can do. I mean, I think it is interesting, an interesting problem to make the web more responsive more responsive in the way that people are expecting apps to be responsive and be installable and that kind of thing. But I think from, from a network API's perspective, think about new, new ways of thinking about applications, applications that just reside on a server somewhere. I'm not going to say the cloud, but on a server somewhere mm -hmm. that uh, like uh, monitors your location with your permission, okay? Um, and and then sends you a text message, uh, you know, in some in in some cases when you when you when you are close to some other uh, location, important so, location, you know, and that has nothing to do with anything that's resident on the phone. It could work across multiple phones. It could work on smart devices that are screenless. Uh, so it's to me that the whole area of network APIs is about leveraging new user experiences that go beyond the kind of beyond the app. So this is exactly what Scott was talking about, right? The, now, he mentioned a, a bunch of different kinds of networks. There's, you've got Bluetooth, you've got Wi-Fi, uh, RFID. Is part of the idea with network APIs to kind of uh, stand, flatten that so that it doesn't matter what kind of connection it is, that you'd be able to get that message, that notification? It shouldn't matter what kind of connection you have, but there are certain aspects of the mobile network capital N, right, which is like a, a mobile, you know, operator network that actually... You're avoiding we, the C word right now. What? Carrier. Oh, yeah, well, I say, oper you know, operator. <laughs> Operator's not, <laughs> yeah. But the, mo sorry, the mobile... Sorry, I'm sorry. That was your opportunity to boo and hiss? <laughs> whenever, whenever carriers or operators are mentioned, I expect a good level of hissing and booing. Well, so, so again, speaking as the representative of the evil operators of the world. Um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, no, in, in all in all seriousness, I, I do think we are we are in a. I, I actually strongly believe that there's that there's a value in the network that cannot simply be unlocked by using it as a TCP connection. So uh, there's messaging, there's location, there's payment, there's a lot of things 
this communication is actually being able to reach out over the over the internet uh, using an API and making a phone ring somewhere else in the world, a real phone, you know, which which I think is extremely valuable and needs to become part of the way that we think about the web. Um, okay, so so messaging, that's kind of the other the other part of the puzzle that, that Scott was talking about. Is something like web intents possibly an answer here in the sense that if you look at intents on Chrome, the idea is a, a, an application register an action and say, when this kind of verb happens, I, I'm in charge of taking care of that. Now, when you've got, you've got something like PhoneGap, which is, can do all the browsery things, but also has access to the hardware API, can't and can I just make a browser using PhoneGap? And now it's a browser that also has access to APIs and register an intent. You could do that, but you shouldn't do that. I shouldn't do that. You could do that, but you shouldn't. Are we getting back to that. security well, so here? Like that, yeah, that walks into a whole security discussion. In intents are interesting. Web intents are really fun. I think they got a little overpopularized, and the word got overloaded, and now I'm not sure what intent means anymore. Because there's an Android -y thing, and then there's a web intent -y thing, but it, it's basically just sending messages across protocol handlers, possibly, um, on different devices. So for PhoneGap's case, you've got a browser, and you have access to essentially all the device APIs. Um, which is okay in a hosted app situation because you're going to go through the security model that lives on that particular device. In Android, when you install something, you see a whole bunch of permissions. You're like, mm, cool, I'll do this, and you install it, great. Yeah, in but App I mean, Store with Apple, you get someone to review it for you, so you know all those apps are secure for sure. Again, to bring up, <laughs> to bring up the poster Sorry. child of, of, of APIs that have actually made it into our devices, geolocation, the user is prompted with a dialogue. Yeah. And they get to choose, right? And but imagine if there's 40 device APIs and they're all in use. Modal dialogue, hell. Can I use your location? Can I access your contacts? Can I write to your file system? Can I use your accelerometer? Like let's, at some point, you're just going to be like, let's be honest. Can work. If I'm if I'm getting an app on 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 the what's it called now? The Google, Google Store? Play. Play. Google Play, Play right? Yeah. And all these different things that I'm supposed to check and tick or untick. It's just like. It's clicking on a EULA, isn't it? I mean, who actually reads that stuff? <laughs> right? <I'm laughs> I know, I know. And that's, that maybe is a problem. Maybe you want a modal first, and you're like, use this API once domain. Remember my choice. Remember my preference. But then there needs to be a GUI to go back and say, well, you know, what permissions did I give these domains to turn on my camera? Almost like with your Twitter, uh, Twitter preferences where you get to see all the Something you... like this. But, I mean, uh, and again, with native versus web, I don't want to get into that, but comparing how things like security are handled in native versus how things like security are handled on the web, it's not like native has got this sorted out. There was a big kerfuffle no. recently with Path yeah. when it turned out that they were sucking down address book details and storing them on their servers, right? So, I mean... It's not like native is a safe place, necessarily. Uh, well, I think it's actually the exact contrary, right? I mean, one of the difficulties with doing a good web device API is that we want to keep that trust that web users have when they go onto the web. Again, nobody wonders when they follow a link if something bad will happen to their device or to them. I mean, except sometimes... Depends on the website, so man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but... You know, this fundamental, fundamental uh, nature of the web where you can actually, you know, follow any link and go anywhere and not ask, uh, you don't have to ask anyone's permission to publish on the web either. That, that's something so fundamental to the web that we obviously need to preserve it when we create these new device APIs. I, I agree. I agree that's fundamental. I was getting a little discouraged from some of the talks yesterday that that seemed to be in some people's minds, it seemed to be an implementation detail rather than something that's core to... We're getting into a pretty big question here, which is like, what is the web? Why, why does the web matter? As opposed to... You know, people seem to be happy with their apps, their walled gardens, their, their safe little stores of managed apps. Uh, why, why do we need the web? I, I think it's, I mean, you're, you're just baiting, obviously, but I yeah, mean, it's, I'm, it's I'm quite I'm playing, clear. <laughs> I'm playing devil's advocate, which always reminds me of that onion headline. Devil's advocate turns out just to be asshole, right? It, I'm, it, I'm being an asshole. I mean, the web has been the, in, in, the engine of innovation, right? And one of the things that I think is troubling with closed app stores is that they have, they're, they're, you know, it's, it's, it, they, they, don't, they will not scale, and, and they will eventually uh, be a... Um, they, they will hold back innovation. You know? okay, Even but, though in the short term but, it see, doesn't seem that way, in the long term it, 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 it seems inevitable that, that app stores hold back innovation. 
So James, James Pierce was trolling yesterday, obviously, and he was sort of kicking the web around. Um, but he, he said something to me a long, oh, quite a long time ago where he's like, I'm not really worried about it because the web's kind of a self-healing system. And I really liked that as a cool way to think about the web as a self-healing system. And so like app stores are these horrible walled gardens of, of bizarre control, uh, essentially censorship vehicles. And we don't want that. That's not what the web is. Um, but Mozilla and Google are both working on this with their own web app stores, and I think there is some standardization happening. Right, the, the, the crucial thing there is that you should be able to buy something in a Mozilla app store that works on Chrome, and you should be able to buy something in a Chrome app store that works on Mozilla. Yeah, a federa or any other federated thing. store system thing of right. some kind, yeah. And so, so it's this whole idea, basically to get back to something else James talked about quite rightly, which is monetization. Mm. That, okay, that is something the app stores have that, that we don't easily have on the web, and if we are able to replicate that aspect of app stores, that a lot yeah, of people I, in this room would be very happy. I think this whole thing is so, so nuts. Like, we keep getting back to monetization of the web. I mean, look at, there's some pretty good examples of people making money on the internet. Like, <laughs> it's happened. Like, those Google guys are onto something with that advertising thing. And you yeah. ask Amazon, I mean, they seem to be selling I, books. I actually agree. I, again, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm playing devil's advocate. And, it, and if you talk to people who are trying to make their money through those app stores, you will find, you know, the, the very much the minority of the people that are doing it and a long tail of people that are not making a yeah. living out of that. A lottery is actually a good way to monetize your business, right? <laughs> <laughs> but, well, but, but the payment question. But the, 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 the other model that's emerging now is in-app payments. And as annoying as it was when I got to the end of uh, the first three levels of Angry Birds space and it said to me, you got to pay up if you want to get into the danger zone. You did it. <laughs> well, no, I haven't actually, but I but I could imagine doing it if my if my daughter bugged me enough about it. I bet I would do it, right? And and I think I I'm really wondering to, uh, is this going to be the new model where um, where we start to think about new functionalities like uh, um, a paper is the other really good example, right? This uh, iPad app mm -hmm. with a beautiful drawing capability and, and you get one tool for free and then you, you can pay for additional tools. And I started to, re start to really think about that. I, I you know, is that, is that the new model and is that, is, how can we enable that? Okay, but that's more about the business side. That's the, the whole freemium thing. I'm talking about uh, the ease of payment in a closed native app store system where they have your credit details credit card details versus the web, the, the lawless frontiers of the web. But, but I think that in, the, in that ease is linked to you are, you are tied into one particular payment system. You're tied into an exclusivity arrangement. And this is one of the reasons why Financial Times took Financial Times out of the App Store and did it up as a um, HTML5 app, right, that is, in my view, kind of the best in class of what you can do on, in terms of a packaged app on, on iPad and, and iPhone. And because they, they can then control which payment provider they use. And, and okay, now you, you, you refer to there as a, a packaged app. That brings up this other idea, again, looking to native for inspiration, this idea of a self-contained package of an app. Two years ago, PPK was speaking at uh, Frontiers, I think it was, uh, and he, he was running down all the various uh, specifications and standard bodies that were looking into wrapping up your website, your web app, into a, a bundle of some kind. And it was the classic example of that XKCD cartoon, right? There are 14 competing standards. This won't do. And the, it ends with, there are 15 competing standards. Um, what happened there? Nobody's talking about that this year at, at Mobilism, and you would think that would... What, did it just lose steam? Are there still 14, 15 competing standards on, what are we calling them, widgets? Um, Package apps? First of all, I think it probably lies to me so to say fault? on stage, widgets are probably dead. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> and a, a lot panda. of my life. But okay. Oh, you know. Know. Now hang on a I second. I think they're being, so the, the, con the deeper concepts like installable web apps, right? Yeah. And the idea is that you've got this thing that lives on, on your device, your phone, or your desktop. Maybe you can share them. And it has a little bit of extra information and possibly it builds in the, or suggests the idea of a permission and security model. So if it's installed on the phone, maybe then we can have a permissioning model that lets it access deeper things. And the web apps working group is now talking about packaging. So from the ashes of the widgets working group rises the phoenix of web apps. And so, and which so, Dom could talk to. Well, I mean, last <laughs> November I co-chaired a workshop 
uh, on this topic, which was, you know, what are we doing w with packaging of web apps? And we have widgets, but nobody seems to like it. You know, we have app cache, and we have other mechanisms that are more, you know, in the kind of HTML5 family. App what? cache. Yeah. Oh, we'll be hearing about <laughs> app cache from Jake. Yeah. Jake, Mr. Mr. Douchebag that. Archibald will be, uh, will be talking about that. <laughs> Um, Let's see, app cache is the douchebag. See, this, this, this whole question of packaged apps came up recently, I think it was on the HTML uh, working group, and it was uh, Tim Berners-Lee said that absolutely this idea of packaged apps on the web are the future, are, need to be part of the future of the web. Hixie said absolutely not, that's not the idea. It was kind of like that bit in the Matrix where Neo and Morpheus are fighting. So I don't know, want to, to know who's Neo in that story, but... Uh, <laughs> Your so perspective on that is so much cooler than it actually was. <laughs> So the actual debate was whether web applications should get access to uh, what we call system-level API. So basically do any kind of stuff uh, uh, which currently is blocked by the browser security model. So that was the debate. Was, uh, packaging was a side debate, whereas uh, Tim, Ber Tim Berners-Lee, or Tim Ber, as we call him, uh, was uh, arguing that once you install an application, then you should grant it, uh, or you could grant it additional privileges. So we keep circling around this topic, security, security, security. It seems to be the fundamental sort of block between what the web can do and what native can do. Um, how are we gonna go, it's gonna keep coming up again and again and again. Uh, is there any kind of meta level view of how, how to solve this? I, I mean, I don't think there is a solution for this. It's not like it is a problem. It's uh, two different approaches to the general question on how do you protect the user when he's using an application. And the web model, again, is the user is safe by default, and uh, you need to work really hard to actually breach that, that, that safety. And that's not the model with a native application. The model is, well, once you said yes, um, good luck if you, if you actually were wrong. Uh, right. What's interesting uh, is that there is also uh, this kind of middle ground that is appearing, and thanks a lot to, to hybrid applications, where you're actually using HTML5, JavaScript, and CSS to build native applications. And so obviously that's the case with FunGab, but there is also Boot to Gecko, there is Tizen, yeah. uh, Microsoft uh, Metro has also this uh, concept. And you know, we, we are starting to look at uh, this space in WCC as well. Uh, to me, it's really an open question to know whether you're still talking about the web or if you're talking mm. about you know, using web technologies but for something that is no longer the web. When, when you're coming up with the, these ways of using web technologies to access the power of device APIs, something like PhoneGap, do you ask yourself, what's the worst thing someone could do with this? Like, what's the worst case scenario? security-wise? Yeah, totally. Has um, anybody built it? Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, no, I mean, yeah, sure. I mean, we've experimented with, like, what could, what could possibly go wrong with a device that can turn on your camera, read your contacts, email all your friends in the background. It'd be right. a bad idea. Um, record your video and audio. 4chan might want to Knows where you, you are, what direction you're traveling, where you've been before. Although, so do the carriers, I mean. Yeah, but then we, we, can trust, we can trust those guys, right? What you're buying, when you're buying it, yeah. I mean, it's, it's a big problem. So like that, that's why I like the packaged idea. And, and phone gaps, you know, it's a hack. It's cheating. We get to piggyback on top of the app stores and let their security be the security for the system. But like a, a packaged web apps kind of standard in these stores could, could conceivably address it. But ultimately, it becomes user option and user's problem. And if they install that rogue app that does something evil, um, this you know, would not be a good thing for the web or for the technology. But you kind of want to say, well, they only have themselves to blame if they gave it permission. Right, and I mean, Which this could happen kind of in like any native app too. Exactly, so. exactly. Yeah. Um, I want to open this up to the audience, so please have your questions ready. But before I do, I just want to sort of ask you guys. So you've got this um, device APIs working group. Is the network is a separate one or, or it's kind of all... I say, I say network standardization of network APIs, I think, is, is still a, a kind of new frontier. Okay, because what I was going to ask is, what, what are you doing over there in the W3C? What, shouldn't you really be uh, at what WG? Because it seems that's where the, the rubber meets the road. That's where stuff happens, and that's where the browser makers are. Well, I mean, last I checked, browser makers are also in WCC. The, the, browser, makers, <laughs> the browser makers are in the W3C, um, the HTML working group, the CSS working group, 
the um, Web Apps Working Group, web apps the working. Device APIs Working Group, the Web RTC Working Group. And I mean, as I said, the only reasonable work we can do in browser space is when browsers are involved. I mean, that's at least my perspective. So, uh, and you're right, in many cases, uh, some of this innovation uh, starts or comes to the uh, what we do. But if you take the camera API, it indeed started uh, in the what we do uh, draft. But now we have a dedicated working group in Dulce. Changes are brought to the spec. And it's not because uh, the work that was done in the what we do was wrong, but just because it's actually a very complex topic and you really need to know a lot of things about video and audio and streaming and uh, uh, the, the camera API also comes into the context of uh, enabling peer-to-peer -peer audio video communication uh, between browsers, so basically the equivalent of Skype in the browser. And let me tell you, <laughs> that's a lot of very detailed technical discussions. I mean, I, I'm a pure web guy uh, uh, as a background and I'm discovering, you know, a number of crazy protocols and discussions about uh, how you are. Codex. Codex yeah. is such a pleasant topic to bring yeah. up. <laughs> Don't bring up Codex. <laughs> I, I think my experience working in W3C for the last, I don't know, se seven years, something like that, I don't know, anyway, was uh, is that very much that uh, W3C keeps what WG honest to a certain degree and that what W3C has a wider participation. And that participation can be annoying sometimes because it slows things down, mm -hmm. but it's important. Uh, and there are things that have uh, come out of What WG. What WG is full of really passionate people that are extremely smart and but tend to have a kind of blinkered view about what the web is and what it isn't, right? Okay. And so I think that the W3C plays plays a really important role in terms of balancing that out. So in the same way we talked about this uh this balance between implementation and specification, there's almost that same balance between the Watt Working Group and the W3C, one keeping the other in check. If we left it all to the W3C, we would take decades to get anything done, I'm sorry. But if we left so, it just to the Watt WG, um, it could be anarchy and chaos and, and everything would be... So I think it's, it's fair to say that you know, there is a balance that is established between uh, Watt WG and WG. I should say also that the Watt WG is actually now uh, WCC community group, so I mean... Yeah, but community groups, come on. I no, mean, we talk seriously. Well, well, they, they don't have teeth. It, it was just a way of getting a patent policy that was, that was okay. Sure, for and WCC. that's exactly the point of community groups. So what I'm saying is, you know, what we could also have said, well, let's say we are uh, doing our own patent policy or something. Yeah. The, the fact that the what we is actually using the community group process means that the pass from the what we g to WCC standardization is also a lot clearer. So, I mean, and, uh, my point is not to get into, you know, this uh, semi-political and uh, uh, historical God discussion. God forbid that but, someone from WCC uh, will get into discussing uh, you know, politics. You know, I don't think that uh, if it was left to WCC, it would take forever. You know, I, I think a lot of the work we do actually takes a lot of time because it's you know, difficult. And, you know, a lot of work, whereas the WattWG wasn't involved, has also made uh, a lot of progress as well without the WattWG. So, uh, you know, I, I think the WattWG is, uh, again, uh, has been a big driver of innovation in the web. It would be completely foolish to ignore it. And, uh, you know, if it were not for the WattWG instead of HTML5, we would be talking about uh, XHTML2, which yeah. obviously... I mean, you, you mentioned all the, the various working groups that, that, that uh, you know, you, you, that browser makers do pay attention to. But things like community groups, I mean, core mob, what's that about? We, we got trolled yesterday by, by James Pierce, and is core mob his kind of official trolling platform for the... Yeah, that's what the charter says, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, more seriously, <laughs> core mob start from the realization that I think some of you might have uh, encountered that it's actually fairly hard to do uh, interoperable web applications development. And the reason for that is actually a very good reason. Uh, the web is a completely open platform, which means that anybody can you know, code their own version of the browser and do what they think is a priority uh, for the web. And that's great. It's not something that we should uh, lose from the web. At the same time, if we actually want uh, you know, for the web platform to be uh, uh, really competitive, there needs to be a greater level of interoperability. And Core Mob is trying to you know, 
put several browser vendors in the same room uh, with a lot of developers, and uh, you are all very much invited to, to join that group, so that you know th there is a consensus that emerges on what the priority should be on what APIs and what features should be developed uh, in as many mobile browsers as possible. Okay, well, because whether the browser makers pay any attention to that list, that wish list. Well, is a whole you know, question. when Facebook talks, I've seen people pay attention. <laughs> so. Okay. Uh, so the web is the web's being driven by what Facebook wants. Yeah, well, I okay. mean, fa yeah. Facebook has a, certainly uh, an important role to play in driving where the web needs to go, as many other players do. But you know, l let's be let's be realistic. If you're a browser vendor, if you're if you're a browser vendor and uh, you want to be successful on mobile, and uh, your your browser doesn't actually work with Facebook, well, you're probably in trouble, right? So. It's not a bad idea for Facebook to be trying to drive this uh, greater level of interoperability, and they have a good business case for it, so it sounds pretty reasonable to me as an approach. I, I look forward to a future where we tug our forelock at Mark Zuckerberg whenever he snaps his finger. Uh, I'm going to open it up to questions, and Jason has one uh, down the front here. Uh, I wanted to go back to the question of payments, because uh, while I do agree that there are businesses that are successful on the web, like if you go back to the axiom of pain versus value, the pain of filling out information when you're purchasing something on a mobile device, you know, if it's a 99 cent purchase, like filling in your credit card may not even be worth that. So when we were talking, when you guys were talking about that, there was no discussion of payment APIs or access to carrier billing or any of that sort of stuff. Like is what does the standard space look like in terms of payment, uh, being able to, you know, one-click um, purchase something? Well, that's exactly what we're working on in Bluevia. I mean, Bluevia is a, one of the features of Bluevia is a platform to do that, both for developers that are working, at, you know, I hate this term, but kind of long-tail developers or developers that are working on, on applications, but also big uh, platforms, um, so uh, where, where we can enable um, people to pay with their mobile phone. Who would have thought the operators would have been interested in that whole area of people paying? Well, money? I mean, you know, operators can do certain things pretty well. One of them is bill people. I was going to say, take, yeah. take money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that sentence could have finished. They are super very good at that. I forgot one one part of the question though, which was I, I've seen like. Um, for example, um, Bango has payment systems, and like the price across all the different carriers is different. Um, I've seen different carriers have APIs. Like, there, part of the question really about payment APIs isn't just simply like if Telefonica is going to provide an API, but like, is it going to be the sort of thing where I have to worry about, you know, the payment system in the UK is being different than the payment system in Spain versus the payment system in other countries? I mean, yes. part of that is a technology issue, but an, another important part of it is a regulatory issue. Once you start to talk about money and taxation, and then, you, then you're talking about regulatory. So in the UK, there's a regulatory scheme called PPP. How many people are familiar with this? Anybody? No? I okay. think we're going to rabbit hole down some very yeah, dull stuff. It's, it's, it's really, 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 it's worse than, it's even worse than that. I mean, you just want to pretty much gnaw your own leg off when you're in a discussion like so this. So I but, think the first step is we get rid of money and... We'll take, we'll take it from there. So in terms of standardization, one thing we've started to look at, but it's uh, really pie in the sky at this point, is uh, using web intent as a mechanism for uh, uh, unifying various payment systems. So again, p you know, web intent is a system where you define a verb and that triggers one or several. So you could say, if any site expects to test payments, I want to set up uh, PayPal as my, right. my provider. So actually, it's not the site, and that's also one uh, of the nice things about uh, um, uh, web intents, that the user would be in control yeah. of what uh, payment system they would be using. So you nice. could have, like, I want this to be built on my operator bill, I want this to be built on my credit card, I want this to be built on my you know, uh, App Store credit or something. Shouldn't the, pro the, provi the, thir the application provider, so say Financial Times, have some role in that as well because they're the ones that are receiving the payment? I mean, I think that's kind of what one of our assumptions right now as we sort of, as we build out our platform is we're trying to work with third parties that 
really have a stake in this and figure out what they want in terms yeah, the, of the, the experience. The person making the payment has a pretty big stake, I would say, and I would rather favor their uh, viewpoint and reduce friction there. So, I mean, in practice, Webinton is flexible enough that you could also filter which providers you actually, uh, actually accept. But okay, we're, we're starting to, to rabbit hole down here. Um, there were more questions? I hope there are more questions. If they're not, then we just, oh, we got one over here. Hi. Um, you guys got me completely confused uh, with your whole web apps versus native debate. Uh, if I'm putting on my native developer hat, or if I put my customer hat on using those devices, when I use things like Instagram or check my tour, which plots my motorcycle tours on to the web and stuff like this, for me, me that's primarily a web app, right? It records data using public protocols, open protocols, onto this big cloud, and I use different kind of UIs to access this data. As a customer, for me, I don't really care if this is written in HTML, which is what you believe is a web app, right? Or if this is a native app. I mean, for, as a customer, I do give a rat's ass who's writing this. So if the most easy way to actually access data on the web on a mobile device is a native app, and as an HTML developer, I will always be years behind. Maybe it's better to use it to look for a different playground and complement those things. So, so I just wanna, as a developer, what? I actually agree with you. If I were to build a native app, and I don't do native apps, if I were to build a native app, I'd build a freaking native app. I'd learn Objective-C or I'd learn whatever the technology is and build a good native app. Sorry, but I believe that's the right thing to do. Um, however, in terms of the, the being no difference in terms of whether it's a web app, whether it's a native app. Uh, there are, I know some people treat it as a, an implementation detail, but the linkability, the addressability of the web and, and the openness of it is actually, a, it's a kind of a big deal. Um, and compared to something that is curated in an app store that you have to download and put on your phone and go through a, a single provider that does not have a URL. And that has, you know, that has control of what is published or not and, you know, to me, the application store process is such a, a backward step when you look at the, the history of the web. And, and I'm talking, you know, I'm taking the customer point of view. You know, if I want to publish an application that is actually not to the taste of uh, the, the application store provider, well, good luck with you with that. If I want to publish something and not to pay 30 percent of what of my revenues to the application store provider, uh, good luck with that. I mean, if you want to write just, code um, for a phone you own, you have to pay right. somebody <laughs> and answer a CLA but, but for the Frank, privilege to do that. Can, can you accept my point in that? I, I actually agree with that. If, if I were to write a native app, I'm sorry, I wouldn't use something like PhoneGap. I would use the right tool for the job, whichever phone I happen to be writing for. Yeah, that's cool. You don't have to apologize. I mean, whatever floats your boat. You write your app <laughs> eight times, man. Well, I'm saying, I mean, like, you, you can do you can do whatever you want. You can learn eight software languages but, and but write eight shitty apps, or you can write it once. Is is phone gap? <laughs> <laughs> is phone gap the there for developer convenience rather than say the the good of the user? It's it's, it's, an, it's, it's a prototyping it. platform. It's an experiment. I don't think it's supposed to answer any of these questions for anyone. It was a it, it's useful for some cases and for some cases it isn't. Yeah, and as you say, as a prototyping app, it, it's it's really handy for standardization of things like device APIs because you're shipping, yeah. you're putting something out there. Yeah, it's running code, and now we'll get the rough consensus hopefully. Great. All right. Well, um, we're gonna we're gonna take a break now, but I think uh, you should uh, join me in thanking my panelists, Dan and Dom. Both panels. Thank you very much. And